This morning, I want to share with you from God's Word what He has laid upon my heart. When I'm reading today from Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1, down to verse 13 altogether now. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon, for thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. Zechariah was a prophet who prophesied during the restoration. You know, God works, God's work we see in cycles in history. If you study the history of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, you'll find that this is how it happened. God called his people to a covenant relationship with him. A covenant is not a contract. A covenant is a relationship where there is a superior and an inferior. The superior is God, the inferior is myself or his people. God called his people to a covenant relationship. And then he blessed them, gave them victory over their enemies. But as usually happens, the people of God began to stray away from the covenant. Backslide break God's laws, worship idols, and begin to live in a callous way, although God had done so much from, for them. And you know, if you study the history of Israel, they repeat it several times, even in the book of Psalms, to see how God was faithful. This was around 520 B.C. or so. But throughout the history of Israel, God had been always faithful to them. But people have short memories, and they forget what God has done. And they stray away from the Lord. Then you know what happens? God doesn't do anything. He just turns his face away. When God turns his face away, from, that's all he has to do. When God turns his face away, then all kinds of things begin to happen. And so in the history of Israel, we see in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came and carried away the ten uh, tribes of Israel captive. They have never been found. And the prophets began to prophesy. When prophets prophesied before these things, we call them pre-exilic prophets. They were warning that things were going to happen. They were warning and telling the people of God, if you stray away, God's judgment is going to come and you're going to suffer. They also said, there's going to be a time of restoration and there's going to be a time when God is going to draw you back. Because God, the primary character of Him is that He's redemptive. God is interested in redemption. 
And anyway, the people of Israel, even after what happened to the northern ten tribes, when Sennacherib came and destroyed even the emperor, the Assyrian kingdom, they began to stray away from God and then the prophets began to prophesy again to the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, and tell them that if you stray away from God, you are going to be experiencing difficulty. And so in 606 BC, the whole nation of Judah, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It was desecrated by Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the emperor of Babylon. And then he took away captives after destroying and assassinating many of the Jews. He took away a majority of the remaining people back to Babylon and they were captives in Babylon. And when they were in Babylon, there was no temple. There were no priests. There were no cell groups. Nothing was there. They had a hard time, you know, according to their frame of reference, they had to have a temple to worship God. The Shekinah glory should be there and so on. But now they were looking at an ash heap and they began to rethink what it really means to be the people of God. And they began to understand that God is more than a building. God is more than an institution. Relationship with God is more than religious rituals. Relationship with God is a covenant relationship. And I must be in love with Him because He is already in love with me and I must never give up to the end of my days. The fire must burn within me as it burned then or more. And then during a period of 70 years, the period of exile, it's called the period of exile. 70 years, three prophets were prophesying. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel were prophesying to these people and telling them and reminding them in what situation they were. And after 70 years of being in Babylon under captivity and difficulty, first the covenant, then break the covenant, then experience suffering and pain, and during that period of exile, then God reminds him, I'm going to restore you again. Covenant, breakage, suffering, and then the promise of restoration, the hope of restoration. And it was during that time that Zechariah prophesied, because it was a time for restoration. They were looking at an ash heap. Everything looked impossible, but God was telling them, I'm in control. I am in the sovereign Lord of the universe, like we sang this morning. I am the God of hope and restoration. I am not done with you, Israel, just like he's not done with Sri Lanka. And there is hope for restoration if you will become my instruments of restoration. So what is restoration? Well, let's say you have some damage on your face, a scar or something like that. Then a plastic surgeon can come along and he can take some skin from some other part of your body and he can graft it and your face can be restored at least almost to its original condition. That's what you call restoration. Restoration is when some calamity has happened and then there is an agent of restoration. The agent of restoration is a plastic surgeon in this case and he comes in and he does a nice job of fixing your face. Now you are a restored person. The same thing in the church of God. There are times of depression. There are times of pain. There are times of difficulty. There are times when we have to walk through the valley of death, walk through the fire and through the flood. But that doesn't last forever. Thank God. And you know that even in your life, when you face difficulty, they don't last forever. There are seasons of difficulty. God carries you through and then He lifts you up. Because God is the God of what? Restoration. God is the God of hope. I want to share with you how you can be an agent or an instrument 
of restoration at this time from the book of Zechariah. He said, I raised my eyes and looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. That was a surveyor. Now, what do surveyors do? They measure the length and breadth of a property. They either do it because they have been uh, assigned to do it. And uh, if they have been assigned to do it, it's by an owner or a prospective owner. Other people can't go and measure lands. And here God has commissioned somebody to measure the holy land. What does that mean? First, God is declaring that He is the owner of His people. Aren't you glad? Nobody else owns me. God owns me. And that's a reassuring thought. But why does He measure? To know the length and breadth. First thing, if you want to be an instrument in the hands of God, know that God measures the church and He measures you because He wants to know what my spiritual condition is. God measures your spiritual condition. God knows at what stage you are in your life. With some of us, He's happy. With some of us, He may be displeased. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian Christians, despite the fact that they were very charismatic, he told them, you guys, some of you are dwarfs spiritually. You don't know anything. When I should be feeding you with meat, I can only give you milk to drink. You are so immature. So God has levels of maturity for us to grow into. And sometimes we are pushed to become mature through the experiences that we have. So in order to be an instrument of God, realize that God has a standard for me and I have to measure it to His standard. Christianity is not a faith where you decide what to do and how to live your life to please God. God has already designed and told me where He wants me to be. Then we read, and there was the angel who talked with me going out and another angel is coming out to meet him who said to him, run, speak to this young man, that's Zechariah, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, let's read it together, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her and I will be the glory in her midst. The second thing about what God says here is, I want to be in the middle, in the center of my people and in the periphery also. I want to be right there at the center. No other thing should be in the middle. And you know what happens to some Christians after a while? When they first come to know the Lord as their personal Savior, they are born again, they are cleansed by the blood of Christ, Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and they are on fire for God. And then after some time, what happens is they begin to prosper. And when they begin to prosper, their eyes get on, on the prosperity part of their lives. And then a small switch takes place. But after a while, what happens is the fire goes down. John Wesley, the great founder of the Methodist Church, said that's called redemption and lift. When you get redeemed and you get lifted up, then you get lifted up. <laughs> and you lose the vision of what it is to be a true follower of Christ. But God wants to be in the center of your life and my life throughout my life. And He wants to be in the periphery of my life. It will be a wall of fire to protect me and it will be the glory in the midst. You want to be an instrument of God, an instrument for restoration. Open your life to the Lord and say, Lord, I have forgotten some things I've strayed away. I may have broken the covenant, but I want you to be in the center of my life. And if we really mean it, and if we really allow Him to be in the center of our lives, how pleased He will be. You know, the goal of our lives as followers of Christ is to please God and glorify Him in every way we can. And when we please God, we know that His hand is upon us. Then we read verse 6. This is what He says. This is God speaking up, up. Flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. 
for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For he thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. There were some people in Babylon still, and God says to them, get out of there and come back to Jerusalem. Because Babylon is a place of compromise. If you want to be an instrument of God, you cannot compromise. You have to stand straight. You can't have your foot in one place in Babylon and the other foot in Jerusalem. And I say that because oftentimes we don't want to identify ourselves as the people of God. It's not safe. There are many times we may betray the Lord right where we are, in the office, among our friends, our social circle. Compromise does not help you to be an instrument of God. Nobody said that life in Zion is going to be easy. Nobody said that there be no persecution and no troubles. Don't be a coward. Stand up for Christ, wherever you are. The Holy Spirit will help you, give you power. Other people are standing up for themselves. What are we afraid of? Everybody stands up for themselves. Only the Christians give a whimper. <laughs> Shame. Stand up for Christ. Stand up for what you believe. Stand up for the fact that Jesus is your Savior and Lord. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. is soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army he shall lead. Not a physical army. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Let's ask some searching questions about ourselves. When it comes to compromise, how is your devotional life now? You know that this is one of the weakest areas in the lives of Christians, especially charismatic Christians. They don't spend time in the Word of God. And I'm appalled sometimes at the ignorance, sorry to say, of people who claim to know the Lord. But these are times of restoration, and we need to correct ourselves. So how much it may hurt sometimes, you got to realize there are things you got to put right in order to be the people, the agents, and the instruments of restoration that God wants us to be. So here God says, escape to Zion from Babylon. And therefore, the Lord's call for us as instruments of restoration is to live an uncompromising life for Him, unashamedly, regardless of what the consequences are. And if we fail to do it, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we will fail the church of Jesus Christ, so escape from Babylon, okay? Sometimes you can't even tell the difference between those who know the Lord and those who don't know the Lord. The behavior is so similar. Most people who don't know the Lord don't read the Bible. The only Bible they will read is your life and my life. And then that will either turn them on or turn them off to the gospel. Here's a wonderful verse, verse 8. Wonderful verse. Look at this. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of the eye. 
First, the word, the term, the compound name of God, Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth. That is used nearly 500 times in the Old Testament. Because during the Old Testament theocracy, God fought physically on behalf of Israel. If he didn't fight physically on behalf of Israel, we wouldn't be standing here today and we wouldn't even know the Lord because unless he protected the nation of Israel, the messianic line would have been destroyed and Jesus would not have been born. That's a simple solution to that, okay? That is why God fought physically on behalf of Israel. And so uh, the term Jehovah Sabaoth, uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, signifies the military character of God. God's nature doesn't change, but in, and in the book of Zechariah, over 53 times, almost 53 times, Yahweh Sabaoth is used to show that during the time of the theocracy, God would fight for them, he would vanquish their enemies and so on, physically. And he did it. In the New Testament, that term, the corresponding term in the New Testament, to Yahweh Sabaoth is used only once. And it's an interesting place that it is used, except in the book of Revelation. In the rest of the New Testament, other than in the book of Revelation, the corresponding term for Yahweh Sabaoth is used only once. Lord God Almighty. And it is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 18. And that clearly tells me so many things. One is that God is not going to fight physically. He is not under obligation. He has not declared himself that he will fight militarily for any nation, nor even the church. Okay? But, in the book of Revelation, seven times the term Pantocrator, which means Lord God Almighty is used because that is the book of the history of the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. That even though God does not fight physically as he did in the Old Testament, throughout the history of the church age, God is fighting on behalf of his people. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. He is Yahweh Sabaoth. And he is the captain of the armies of the church. And what does it say? He who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. That's true, even today. And you know, the pupil of your eye is a very sensitive spot. It's through that pupil that light comes into your eyes. And God feels it when you are hurt. Isn't that wonderful? God feels it when you are hurt because he loves me so much he cares for me so much I was at the hospital one day and there was this just you know there was this uh, mother who had this baby and she was hanging out with the baby and uh, they were in that section where they give injections and so on so the mother was holding the baby like this the baby was going to get an injection so the nurse came with the needle and as the nurse approached the baby the mother it's beautiful though isn't it she didn't even feel it but she was feeling for her baby if that's the way the mother felt for the baby how do you think God feels for me. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Don't I want to serve a God like that? Yes, I do. Hallelujah. I want to serve a God who feels for me and he declares unashamedly, he who touches you, touches the apple of my eye. And that's true. Verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming an agent of restoration has a joy of the Lord because he has experienced the peace of God even in the midst of trial. Now some of you are going through difficult situations. Your bodies are aching. Your businesses are failing. You can't get up. When you have to get up, you have to get up about three times before you get up. 
and uh, you, you know, and, and so many other issues, <laughs> right? And uh, sometimes you're having troubles with your children and family and conflicts in your workplace, and you don't know whether you're coming or going. You don't know your future and what the future holds. You're so uncertain and frustrated about the current situation. But if you compromise, you're going to get depressed. I can tell you that. When you compromise your faith, it's going to lead to discouragement and depression. That happens. And entertainment is not going to set you free from it. But if you stand for the Lord, regardless of whether you're going through difficulties, I can tell you, the Holy Spirit will give you his joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. And you will be an instrument of restoration wherever you are. Because the Holy Spirit is on you. Verse 11, wonderful promise. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and they shall become my people. This is a prophecy of what is going to happen Zechariah was told, and I, I don't think he would envision it properly, fully at that time. The prophets prophesied without knowing everything about what is going to happen. And here, the Lord is saying, there are going to come a day when all the nations are going to come to the Lord. You know, that was outside of the frame of reference of the Jews. They couldn't believe that anybody else would be the people of God except themselves. You know, God always you know, adjusts our frame of reference. He takes us beyond our own thinking. And this is uh, a prophecy about the Messiah. Jesus came. And when Jesus came after 400 years of silence and John the Baptist was the forerunner, Jesus came. And many nations on the day of Pentecost heard the gospel and they were grafted into the kingdom. And when you're an instrument of restoration, you will have the joy of salvation and you will share the gospel and you will talk about Jesus and live for Jesus wherever you are. The impelling, compelling motive of your life will be to live for Jesus. And that determines every decision I make. That determines every way I relate to other people. That determines the ethics of my life. That determines because I love Jesus and I want to live for him. I'm an agent of restoration. Hallelujah. And then finally, verse 13. Is another eschatological term or verse. Be silent all flesh before the Lord for he is aroused from his holy habitation. What is he talking about? He's talking about the coming of the Lord. What Zechariah is saying is, Everybody is talking a lot, and it looks like God is silent, but God is going to rise. God is going to rise up from his holy habitation. That's going to happen. He's going to rise. 